Um, well, anyway, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here with Jonathan, and I can tell you that his book is superb, and I'll tell you why. Um, you'll see on the front, anyway, there's a quote from me saying it's an immediate classic, and so other, many others have said similar things. And it's an important book for two reasons. One, A, it's an absolutely gripping story and a gripping read, uh, the whole question of the escape from Auschwitz. But it's also a very important one because it brings out the whole question of how such an evil could come about and could actually be perpetrated in the way that it was. Uh, and it's something which also has fascinated me anyway, because I, with uh, my wonderful Russian colleague, Luba Vinogradova, we did a book on uh, Vasily Grossman's own uh, journalism, and especially Treblinka. He uh, examined this whole question. How was it that the Nazis managed to achieve this appalling killing machine uh, with relatively few guards. Uh, and I think that this is a very important question uh, if we are going to understand the nature of evil and how it actually uh, can be perpetrated and how people do not take it seriously enough uh, or, fit or really recognize uh, the messages in advance. Um, anyway, the point is that, uh, first of all, I think that uh, uh, I want to get, obviously, Jonathan to talk the most about, especially about the whole question of what they got out of Auschwitz, which was so important, uh, and why it was so important uh, during their escape, and then also a certain amount about the escape itself. But there are other issues which we'll come to during the course of the conversation, and of course when we come to uh, the uh, Q&A session at the end when you can ask your questions. So, Jonathan, talk a little bit, please, about uh, what you were doing with the book and what you were trying to do, and the story itself. Thank you, uh, Anthony. Thanks to all of you for staying to the afternoon session of a very long and hot day. Um, really grateful for that introduction and your kind words about the book. Yeah, at the centre of this story is a teenager. He was just 17 years old, Rudolf Verber from provincial Slovakia, a Slovak Jew, who arrived in Auschwitz in the last day of June of 1942, age 17. And... Uh, as many of you will know, the life expectancy of a Jew in Auschwitz was measured in hours. Uh, most were taken immediately to their deaths in gas chambers. A small percentage, between 5 or 10%, were taken off to uh, be uh, wor worked as slaves, as slave laborers. And usually their life expectancy was a matter of weeks or months because it was annihilation through labor in the words of the Nazi policy. They, they were worked to death. Despite that context, incredibly, the teenage Rudolf Verber uh, lived and survived through Auschwitz for 21 months, which makes him extremely unusual, even if, he, if that had been the end of the story. That was a vanishingly rare achievement. Uh, and as a slave, he was bounced around Auschwitz-Birkenau and used in almost every part of the camp, and that meant, therefore, he was an eyewitness to every stage of the killing process. From the instant the Jews would arrive on those trains, his job for a long period was disembarking, getting the people off those trains, all the way up to, as it were, the the gates, the doors of the gas chamber, gas chambers itself. He never, he, there were people who worked literally inside getting the bodies out. He wasn't one of those, but every other part of the process he saw. And it was through that, that, and I think sometimes it, with the kind of clarity of a young person as a teenager, it was when he was working on that railway platform, getting people off those trains, with the kind of clarity that young people sometimes have, he saw very quickly this realization of what the key ingredient of the Nazi method was, which is he understood very rapidly that everybody arriving on those trains, in his experience, bar none, had no idea what fate awaited them. They were entirely in the dark at what Auschwitz meant. And because of that, he thought, they therefore uh, would comply with the orders that the SS gave them to line up, and form columns and rows of five, they would comply with those orders relatively calmly in relatively orderly fashion. Uh, 
Uh, and that was what enabled the entire system to work, to work smoothly. And he realized that was the case, not because these people were stupid, but because they had been lied to and deceived at every stage of the journey. We can get into some of the detailed ways they were deceived, but he understood that with great clarity that the Nazis had built a system here, almost like a factory, a sort of assembly line of death where it worked because everyone proceeded through in this very orderly fashion, and that was because they had been lied to. And he therefore realized the only way you were ever gonna throw sand in the gears of this killing machine was if somehow you broke, uh, you tore through that veil of ignorance that these victims were behind, and you broke the deception and you somehow were able to warn the Jews of Europe what fate awaited them. So it was really while working, teenage boy, 18 years old by then, on that railway platform, he had this um, profound realization, the only way to halt or slow down more accurately, the killing machine is to warn these people what fate awaits them. And that, he knew, would mean somebody would have to escape. And again, with the wonderful sort of confidence slash arrogance of youth, he thought that somebody might as well be me. Now, this is absolutely true. And also, what I find striking is the way that the war's disbelief, um, not just from the point of view of uh, the victims, who were deliberately lied to, but also uh, emotions were switched between fear and hope. Quite often they were given hope at key moments uh, by um, the offer of towels, or as if they really were going to uh, have showers or de-lousing or whatever, before the, uh, in, instead of being actually being sent to the gas chambers. Now, I mentioned Treblinka, but um, even um, what Grossman managed to do in one of his interviews, and this, remember, came later, this was with the advance of the Red Army, and they managed to uh, interview people who'd been guards there, but also locals, as well as uh, victims who'd actually survived and broken out and hidden in the forest and so forth. But in uh, most cases, going right back to the beginning, what one has to remember is that the idea of mass slaughter, of total annihilation, seemed beyond anybody's imagination. Now, think of Babi Yar. In 1941, when the uh, German Sixth Army reached uh, Kiev, uh, or Kiev as it is now, um, there, 30,000 Jews turned up when they were told to, um, by the German authorities because they were told they were just going to go and be resettled. Um, they could not imagine or believe, in fact, they were going to be taken out to these huge pits uh, and, and massacred. Uh, now, one of the reasons for this, of course, was that during the Nazi-Soviet pact, the whole question of German anti-Semitism had been completely suppressed in Russia uh, during that particular period. And when it came to the end of the war, uh, Stalin, who did not want to have the Jews seen as a special category of suffering, uh, had the party slogan made into uh, do not divide the dead. And so people would, could be referred to as Poles or Soviet citizens or whatever. But the fact that they were Jews was never mentioned because Stalin did not want specifically any um, uh, sympathy, if you like, for uh, the Jews. So there was this suppression. And I mean, one of the things which shocked me the most was to find the pogroms uh, which were taking place in 1945, particularly in Kiev, where a Jewish officer of the NKVD uh, was, uh, was killed. Um, and um, then there was a, um, the um, uh, NKVD uh, tried to arrest some people. Uh, and uh, they all went and um, beat up all the Jews they could find. So, I mean, nobody really knew what was going on. And as I say, it was suppressed by the authorities. So it was a sort of vital element during this particular during this particular period. Uh, completely. I want to pick up that very brilliant point you're, you cite, cite in Grossman at hope and fear. Yes. So what, what Rudy saw uh, working on that platform was that deception deployed both of those things. Uh, and that the deception, the, the sort of cunning of it, the way it played on human psychology was, was very striking. So all the time, the, the, the prospect of life uh, was 
dangled in front of those Jewish victims as they arrived. So they would, they would be asked, you know, what is your trade? What is your profession? It's very important that we know exactly your profession because we want you to work in your chosen occupation. Once you're, once you're cleaned up, well, of course, if you're a, uh, you know, a blacksmith, you must work as a blacksmith. If you are a tailor, you should work as a tailor. This assumption that life would continue, they were uh, sent letters. Uh, the Jews in the ghettos were, or, or in, before deportation would receive letters from relatives who'd gone earlier, uh, gone ahead of them. And the letters would say, you know, that life here is good and we are starting, you know, a new life in a new community is what they thought because they'd been told to, uh, or encouraged to believe that. Uh, and often these letters were written, of course, under duress, uh, effectively at gunpoint. And fascinatingly, the people sending the letters would somehow try and convey to the recipient that something was wrong codedly. Uh, and so there would be a message, somebody would write to a sibling and say, and as you know, mother sends her love. And the recipient would receive the letter thinking, but our mother died five years ago. Why are they saying that? Um, it was an attempt to try and say something's not right. In one case, and this is a reference that uh, you know Jews would have understood, but uh, they would say, everything is fine here. We eat every day as if it was Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is a fast day. So it was a coded way of saying there is no food here. But the official message was everything is fine. Even down to, at the last moment, and Anthony mentioned that the Jews going into gas chambers sometimes, not always, depending which place, would be handed a towel and soap as if they were to be cleaned up. The deception would go on to the last minute. But I found in one written account where the SS man would say, remember, tie your shoes together, left and right shoe together. It will, you don't want to have to waste time afterwards finding your shoes to make them into a pair. Of course, there was no afterwards. But even at the last moment, you were believing in a future. And the first place where Rudy worked was a place that became nicknamed Canada. Uh, Canada, because in the Central European imagination of that time, Canada was thought to be a place where the streets were paved with gold. A lot of people had emigrated from Czechoslovakia and so on and made new lives in Canada. There was a place called Canada in Auschwitz because there was were untold riches and uh, how could that be possible? Rudy worked there, and he's almost within a few weeks of arriving at Auschwitz. And sure enough, there were piles of men's clothes, women's clothes, pots, pans, children's toys, children's textbooks. Hair. Yeah. Well, that's to come later, but here, and these piles were the possessions that people had brought with them. Um, the, and what he realized, two things he realized, was that all the people bringing these things had assumed they were coming to make new lives. That's why they'd brought exercise books for their children and toys for their children, prams, because they thought, we're, we're starting a new life in a new community. It's not a place we've chosen to live, but we're going to live here. And only slowly, and later in life, Rudy would be embarrassed that he didn't realize this straight away. He looked around and saw there are men's clothes and women's clothes, but also children's clothes and yet I look around this camp and there are no children so slowly he realized there are more there's more stuff here than there are people and only then and he remember he'd been in Auschwitz for several weeks only then did he understand this is a place the like of which has never existed before this is a killing factory there is more stuff here than people because some people are arriving here and being murdered on arrival it took him time to realize that for the reason you said which is then, now we have hindsight. We know the word Auschwitz, and we know that mass slaughter of that kind is possible. He and all the people there couldn't even really imagine it up until they were forced to see it directly in front of them. I think I might very quickly, I hope very quickly, mention um, the, 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 the not so much the process, but if you like, the sequence of events of what people outside uh, Germany, outside the Axis regime, uh, actually started to know. Now, the first hints came of the mass killings in the summer, late summer of 1941, when British signals intercepts, i.e. Ultra, um, at Betchley, they started to get the messages from the different Einsatzgruppen and so forth, which they uh, listened to, and they started to get an idea of the massacres of Jews. And this is what um, Vasily Grossman described as the Shoah by bullets. And the vital thing being, obviously, 
we went from the Shoah by bullets to the Shoah by gas. And obviously, but for historians, it's always been very important to understand when that process, when that change came from the mass murder uh, in the old-fashioned way, one could say, of uh, the bullets, uh, then came through to the killing by gas, the real industrialization of the final solution. Um, and, you know, that's still not absolutely clear. Did it come at the end of 1942 or at some particular point? Uh, then there was the Wannsee uh, conference. Um, you know, to what degree was that, was that the real decision on the final solution? Not surprisingly, of course, Hitler and the SS made sure that there was very little written down because they realized, and this is one of the reasons one has to, it's an important subject, were they actually going to switch to killing by gas because they had suddenly started to realize they might possibly lose the war, i.e. 1942 was the churning point of the war. Uh, one can argue that the end of December 1941 was, if you like, the geopolitical turning point of the whole war because by then America was into the war and the Germans had failed to capture uh, Moscow. But, I mean, then, in fact, it wasn't really until Stalingrad, which was the psychological turning point, when everybody realized that Germany was going to be defeated. And this is where one really is interested in the fact of whether the Germans at that particular point were determined to try to accelerate the whole process because even if they were defeated, they want to make sure that the Jews were killed beforehand. And th this is why, and this is what's so important again in uh, this book, is what Rudi Orba was trying to do uh, was to get the word out, especially to the Hungarian Jews, because that was the last great wave of uh, killing. And maybe you could talk a little bit about the Hungarian Jews. Yes. Uh, I mean, the, on, just on your first point about what the world knew, Rudy sitting there in Auschwitz and his fellow inmates of Auschwitz were convinced that the world knew nothing of Auschwitz. They were convinced for that for two reasons. The first was those people getting off the trains to a man and woman and child had no clue, as he saw it. But second, he believed the proof that the world could not know was the fact that Auschwitz existed. He saw these people being killed hour by hour and thought there is no way that the world would be allowing this to happen if they knew. And therefore, he felt the existence of the camp itself was proof that the world was in ignorance of it, which is, you know, a sobering thought. But he was sure that they did not know. Um, but he realized himself uh, that this was a crucial factor, as we've said, that the ignorance was vital. And he could see every day that there were Jews arriving from all points of Europe, Belgium, Holland, France, Germany, other parts of Poland, and so on. And he understood that they were seeing Jews from everywhere, except they had not seen the Jews of one community. There was one community left in Europe that had not been touched, and that was the Jews of Hungary. Numbers between 600,000, perhaps 800,000, a very large Jewish community, and there had been none of them. And in January of 1944, so late, and as Anthony's been saying, at a point where the war... Is, with the Germans are clearly on the losing side, they get word. They hear SS officers who would nick, had sort of code words for uh, different Jewish communities. In other words, if uh, the Dutch Jews were coming, they would say, we're expecting some fresh cheese because of Dutch cheese. Uh, we are expecting chalva, they would say, for the Greek Jews. The word started getting around that we are expecting some fine Hungarian salami. They knew that Hungary's Jews were next. And that is what made Wetzler and Werber, Fred Wetzler was six years older than Rudy, both from the same hometown in Slovakia, realized they had to do this urgently. They had to get out to warn the Jews of Hungary. And that was really their animating purpose. When they finally came to plot their escape, uh, their, their driving motive and the urgency was we have to warn the Jews of Hungary so they at least can have the one thing that all these other Jews who've been arriving day after day, sometimes up to five trains a day were arriving, uh, they can have what all those other previous uh, train loads of Jews did not have and that is knowledge to be forewarned. And so at the point of, you know, at that point that I described a few moments ago, of realization of what was going on, Rudy had, I think to my mind, as incredible as his escape, was this decision he made, which is, I will have to bring out myself the data 
of death, the facts of this place. Obviously, I can't write anything down. You'd be that would be an instant death sentence if you're found with documents or a piece of paper or a pencil. He memorized every transport that arrived in Auschwitz that he saw. He remember he would count the number of wagons, cattle cars. He would estimate how many people per wagon. He would know the point of origin, which town it come from, Grodno in Poland or whatever, the date, and he would commit it to memory. He said afterwards he did it like a child's memory game. Those, you know, the people say, I went to market and I had a tomato, a cucumber, and a loaf of bread. The next day, a tomato, a cucumber, a loaf of bread, and an orange. That's how he did it. Each day, he would add another transport until he had the data of 300 transports in his head, each one identified by the numbers uh, that were allocated to those people who had taken off the transport as to be used as slaves. The number famously that was tattooed on the arms of Auschwitz prisoners, those numbers always related to a specific transport. And one story which I might mention now, which is there were some historians afterwards uh, were puzzled by or questioned whether it was really possible for Verber to have memorized this level of detail. How could any one person carry these numbers? And some people said, no, they, you know, they were skeptical and so on. I found uh, in the documents a letter uh, in, from many years later in which this episode was described. Rudy Verber was in New York City in the 1970s. It was a hot day. He was at a restaurant. A waiter came to his table with his sleeves rolled up and Rudy saw the number inked on the waiter's arm and said, 15th of May, 1943, Benjamin Poland, and the waiter looked at him and said, how did you know? And that's because Rudy had memorized every single transport. That was the knowledge he carried in his head, and partly because he feared that if he managed to escape and said, there is a place that is doing mass killing, people would say, you're a teenage boy, why would I believe you? He knew he had to have actual facts, dates, places, numbers. So that was, and that was all prompted by his, the, or the urgency was prompted, exactly as you say, by the need to give a warning to the Jews of Hungary. One question which I think we must cover very, very quickly, because there's always been a great debate about it, is the whole question of uh, the accusation uh, that the Allies never took it seriously because they didn't bomb the railway lines or intend to, or try to bomb the, bomb the camps. Um, and I think it's important. What's got to understand, yes, there was this obsession on the part particularly of Bomber Harris, the head of British Bomber Command, RAF Bomber Command, um, who didn't believe that anything should interrupt or interfere with the total destruction of German cities because he was convinced that was the way to finish the war quickly. Uh, he even felt that actually there was no need really to invade Europe, um, that the war could be finished entirely with his bombers. And I'm afraid this is often an obsession by air war uh, bosses. Um, of course, that was absolute rubbish. But but it did mean, though, that he was not keen or when he was told, finally, by Churchill and by Anthony Eden um, that actually the RAF Bomber Command should start considering uh, trying to stop the railways uh, and of the Hungarians and so forth all being moved uh, up towards Auschwitz for their death. Um, the point was, though, also there was actually a very uh, logical uh, military reason why it wasn't possible. The trouble was that the heavy bombers, which had the range to get all the way to Poland, simply didn't have the accuracy. I mean, they were the reason why they were smashing German cities was simply because uh, they could not drop their bombs accurately. Usually, uh, they couldn't get them within a five-mile um, circumference of their target. Uh, the, the British, remember, were bombing by night. The Americans were bombing by day. Um, and the only time they really hit Auschwitz was actually by accident. They were trying to uh, bomb the Buna um, camp. Um, and the other, um, any other possibility was actually to use light aircraft like the Mosquito fighter bombers, which were very accurate indeed. But of course, they didn't have the range to get all the way to um, Poland and back. So that was one of the reasons why it was quite easy for the reluctant uh, RAF uh, chiefs uh, to be able to um, brush 
the request by uh, Eden and uh, Churchill uh, aside, simply saying it's not physically possible or it's not uh, uh, militarily uh, um, interesting or worthwhile uh, to even attempt to do this. Um, and one has to remember when it came to the Warsaw Uprising, uh, which started in August 1944, um, then they had to fly from Italy. Um, and um, even then, it was very, very hard. And they weren't even able to drop the uh, the rifles and uh, guns to the uh, those who were revolting in Warsaw uh, against the Germans uh, with any accuracy. So that was the problem there. I, I have a question on that for you, but yes, but but, but but in fact, why don't I lead into it by saying something about how the, how central this story is to that? I mean, yes. but there's a specific question. So the the, the what Verba and Vetsa did relates exactly to what everything Anthony has been telling us about because. Um, they did manage to escape. And the I don't want to tell you exactly how they did it, because I want you to read the book. But it is, to my mind... Um, an extraordinary story, I can tell you. I well, that's very... Because I'm obviously very biased. But I, and I, uh, but I think it is the most thrilling individual escape story of the Second World War, just because Jews in Auschwitz were the most severely guarded prisoners anywhere in Europe. So it was the hardest place. To be a Jew in Auschwitz meant that was the hardest place to escape. There had been escapes from Auschwitz. Soviet prisoners of war had done it. Polish, non-Jewish Polish, political prisoners, some had done it. Vanished, you know, almost impossible for a Jew to escape Auschwitz. They somehow managed to do it. As I say, I'm not going to give away completely how, except to say that they spotted a gap in the Nazi defences. Not a physical gap. There wasn't like a hole in the fence somewhere, but rather a kind of loophole. And the, with, again, with tremendous ingenuity, these two young men realized there was a way to, to use, in some ways, the Nazi system against them. I, I won't say any more than that. It is an extraordinary, to my mind, thrilling story. Once out, that isn't the end of it, because they are then, of course, in Nazi-occupied Poland. And uh, as Rudy would later say, uh, we found ourselves outside, but with no map, no compass, no friends. You know, but Poles and others got out. There might have been resistance networks they could join up with. For the Jews, they were on their own, these two. They had to cross mountains and rivers and marshland. They had to do it at night, no food. Uh, they arrived, you know, they had to um, sort of forage their way through forests at one point through a sort of frozen stream, etc. Somehow they made it to their home country of Slovakia. There they made contact with a tiny remnant Jewish community of Slovakia. And in hiding in a basement in the provincial town of Zielina, they pour out, Rudy especially, this data that he'd memorized every transport. And they, it's written down, they dictate it. It's typed up into a 32-page single-spaced report, which then embarks on its own journey, hand-to-hand, -hand, in secret, uh, being passed by resistance figures uh, to diplomats, to church people, journalists, until eventually it reaches Churchill in London, Roosevelt in Washington, the desk of Roosevelt in Washington, the Pope in Rome. And that, as I understand it, plays a big part in then this debate about should we bomb or not. It's because attached to the report, by the time it reaches there, is actually a formal plea from Jewish leaders, almost sort of paperclip to the front of the report saying, you now know what's going, going on in Auschwitz, please bomb the railway tracks. This is a factory of death. The railway tracks are in effect the conveyor belt, bomb the tracks. So Anthony explained why the RAF, the British, couldn't do it. Accuracy, the, si the size, and bombing at night. So my question to you was, fine, that explains why the British couldn't do it. Could the Americans have done it? The Americans didn't really have um, the right aircraft either. Um, and even if you took the um, different air bases, uh, they could get to, say, southern Romania. And they did have, and they, in fact, lost virtually 80% of the aircraft sent against the Ploesti um, oil fields there. Um, when it was a question, though, of um, flying up to um, Poland, um, you know, their only way really was could they then land in Soviet territory, refuel, and then come back? 
because, you know, it was basically, it was a one-way trip uh, from that point of view. Um, but the Soviets did not like the idea of having American aircraft. Uh, and in fact, there were only about two cases when the Americans did allow, uh, sorry, the Soviet authorities did allow the Americans actually to land in Soviet territory. So this was, this was the problem. I mean, even, though, even with liberators, which could uh, fly a long way out into the Atlantic and back, I mean, the distance to uh, Auschwitz uh, um, was just simply was too great. So this debate goes on now, um, still, and 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 you know, Anthony's shed a whole lot of light on it. What I was going to say, we talked about this just a bit before, is Rudy himself. That was not his number one focus, actually. The Allied bombing. That wasn't the main purpose in getting out the report. As we just said a few moments ago, his main purpose was warning the Jews of Hungary. That was his driving aim, and. The day the report was completed, you know, they had to type it up and translate it and so on. But the day it was completed, the person he had been dictating this all to in that basement of the old age home, the old people's home in Zillin, the man who had been on the type, you know, as it were, on the typewriter, takes it, puts a staple in it, and goes immediately to meet the de facto leader of the Jews of Hungary and hands him the report and says, here's the warning of what's going to happen. That man was called Reju Kastner. It's a huge controversy which we could talk about for a long time, but the crucial thing is Kastner does not pass on that report. That warning document that Rudy and Fred had done everything to get out basically stays in a drawer in, uh, in an office in Budapest. That Rudy in later life could not bear um, because he believed the Jews of Hungary needed to have that warning. He was not naive about this. He did not think that if the Jews of Hungary got the warning, they would suddenly launch an armed revolt. They were old. They were children, some of them. They, were, they had no access to weapons. He didn't think that. But he did think if they have the knowledge, they might at the very least, as they are ordered onto those trains, they might panic. There could be chaos there could be a stampede. Some might try and run away. And that he knew, from having been on that railway platform for 10 months, he knew that alone would slow down the Nazi efficiency. He said in a very, it's a quite chilling phrase in later life, he said, it is much easier to kill sheep than to hunt deer. What he meant by that was the Jews were going through into the, Nazi, into the gas chambers in a way, in the same way, like sheep to an abattoir, not because they were weak people or passive people, but because they had been so comprehensive, comprehensively deceived. But if they had scattered into different places, yes, the SS would have picked them off with weapon, with firearms, and shot them with rifles. But like deer, that would have made them uh, s slowed things down. But that report never reached the Jews of Hungary. And so in, in a 56-day period, Rudy escaped uh, the end of April, or by the time he reached Slovakia, late April 1944. In May and June of 1944, in a 56-day period, 437 hung thousand Hungarian Jews were taken to Auschwitz. Every one of those lives was a life that Rudy believed could have been saved if his warning, if the Jews of leadership and Hungary had stood on the rooftops and shouted, do not get on those trains. That's what he wanted. He believed those lives could have been saved. But it's certainly true that in a number of the camps, um, there were revolts. And for example, Treblinka at Sobibor, um, in one or two cases led by Jewish officers from the Red Army, who'd been then captured and then um, transferred, if you like, into the killing program. So, um, I mean, Rudy was absolutely right from that point of view. And as you say, causing chaos was one way of actually slowing down um, the whole process. Um, one question which actually, um, Johnson, I've been longing to ask you, but maybe um, do say if you think it's um, too heavy here, but I mean, you know, whenever one reads your book or any other book about the Holocaust, and uh, I, I, I don't know how to answer it, but you know, 
does evil exist? Is it a just a sort of religious or philosophical concept, or um, can we can we actually sort of identify it in a particular way? Um, at times, I feel one certainly can. Um, at other times, I, I, I'm I, I'm baffled. But um, did, did you find this when sort of when writing the book? Yes, and I think we should be uh, not not be bashful about asking about this or talking about this kind yes. of thing because this is where it leads you. This sort of subject yes. and the presence of evil in our world. People are capable of evil acts. We can agree on that, and that people are capable of them. Uh, and in a way, it's such a th it's so, so little holds us back from doing them. Um, and the you can't contemplate this history without thinking there is. There, you know, it's a real presence. Whether you put a kind of religious gloss on that is is a different thing, I think. Mm. But you have to reckon with that capacity for great evil, and it forces you to do that. And um, I don't think there's any other way out of it. I mean, I remember attending as a long, long time ago as a student a lecture on this subject given by a very great uh, scholar in Israel called Ze'ev Mankiewicz, who would give a lecture on the Holocaust, and he would write on the top of the blackboard, how was the Holocaust humanly possible? Yes. And he would then go through the different history, well, for one thing, the history of German anti-Semitism. He would talk about the war and the different circumstances, the structure of the Third Reich. He would talk about, you know, the deception that we've talked about. He would talk about uh, the isolation of Jewish communities. And he would, he would fill a very good hour-long lecture that enabled you to understand. And then he said, after this, there is only one question left. And he went back to the blackboard, and with his chalk in his hand, he wrote again the words, how was the Holocaust humanly possible? The question remains. It's not, it's not possible to answer it even as you answer it. Well, it, the question certainly remains. But I mean, there's also so much confusion. I mean, when one thinks of uh, Daniel Goldhagen's book, Hitler's Winning Executioners, um, I think that that was actually an awful book, an appalling book in some ways, because Goldhagen um, suffered from such confirmation bias that he was convinced that somehow um, anti Semitism was somehow ingrained in um, the German character or soul, as if there was some sort of DNA, uh, which must be wrong. I mean, under Frederick the Great, you know, uh, Prussia was the least anti Semitic country in Europe at that particular time. So it came in in a different way. I mean, one can look as historians who can look and examine uh, the different influences, whether from Russia or Austria or in different places basis at different times. And of course, the wonderful Raoul Hilberg in his book, you know, The Destruction of the European Jews, in one of his introductions, he said, if at the beginning of the 20th century uh, you had uh, wondered or you had predicted uh, that one country, a civilized country in Europe, uh, would actually indulge in, well, indulge is the wrong word, but would actually go for the mass, the massacre uh, of uh, Jews on an industrial slaughter, you would have said, oh, those French, they're capable of anything. And one has to remember the atmosphere. I mean, unless one actually sort of reads the details of the Dreyfusa and the anti Dreyfusa and all the rest of it of that particular period. And even today, occasionally in France, one can be shaken rigid by anti Semitic remarks, which, you know, I don't think, I hope not, would not be the case so much in England. But well, I think the, there is a way of answering the question which is not meant to be more bleak, but yes. it could be, which is. I agree about that, about the, 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 it's nonsensical to start looking into sort of the German DNA or German soul, but partly for a dispiriting reason, which is your earlier point about how was it possible in Treblinka, for example, with so few guards. Yes. And the answer, I'm afraid, in many of these countries is that it wasn't the Germans alone, as, as obviously you will know, who were uh, implementing the Holocaust. Yep. I mean, the, I did an interview with a Holocaust survivor that appeared in the Guardian last week, and he talked about the he was a 12-year-old in Auschwitz, and the people he encountered in his, you know, the, his tormentors included, as he said, Estonians, Latvians, Hungarians, Lithuanians, Ukrainians, yes. um, and you know, when uh, the, I was very struck by this fact that the f f famous, notorious anti-Jewish propaganda film, The Eternal Jew, the, the place in Europe where it was a, a box office hit was France. Yes. Um, you know, so this, we, this was a Europe-wide enterprise. And, to, and what that leads me to is, to not, is not to say there's something peculiarly German. Rather, there is something peculiarly human. 
and this is this wonderful man I interviewed last week. It's in you can look it up online in the Guardian. His name is Ivor Pearl, age ninety one. He said, uh, "What he's not angry with the Germans. He's angry with what human beings allow themselves to do." And that's great, to my mind, great word of wisdom. I wanted to say one thing about the apparent failure of the Verba Wetzler report, which because it was not passed on, and we can get into that in questions of why it wasn't, uh, it, can, it appeared to Rudolf Verba for much of his life as if he had failed because that warning had not been passed on. Nevertheless, in fairness to him and his achievement and the historical record, we should say it's all in the book, but... Through eventually the report, and it was passed hand-to-hand, -hand, as I said, across borders, to my mind, and I'm obviously professionally biased here, to my great relief, it did finally reach the hands of a journalist, and a British journalist at that, a man called Walter Garrett in Zurich, uh, an agency journalist who published the Verba Wetzler report in late June of 1944. Now, at last, it was public. And therefore, those private conversations that were going on with Bomber Command in London and in the councils of power in Washington, now Roosevelt, Churchill, the Pope, their own publics now knew what they had known, that Jews were being killed in Auschwitz. And so now they have to act. And so the Pope writes to the leader in Hungary and says these unfortunate souls who are being deported to the death, he doesn't say the word Jews, but you're, these unfortunate souls are being deported, you, I plead to you as a Christian brother to stop. And Roosevelt, via uh, an intermediary, similarly writes to the leader in Hungary and essentially says, if we win the war and you lose, we will hold you accountable for war crimes. And at that point, as a, as a result of the publication of the Verba Wetzler report, the leader, the regent in Hungary, orders the deportation, uh, the halting of the deportations, just as they were about to deport the Jews of the capital city, Budapest. It means that 200,000 Jews who would have been deported then were not because of the actions of Rudi Verber and Fred Wetzler, which is why I think you heard in the introduction uh, earlier that I say that he is a towering figure. They both are towering figure of this period whose story deserves to rank alongside Anne Frank or Oscar Schindler or Primo Levi. 200,000 lives uh, that would have ended at that moment uh, were not because of his uh, actions, all done while he was still a teenager. He was just 19 when he did it. I see it's reached uh, five o'clock. So uh, it is a question of questions from the audience. So um, I think there's going to be a microphone or two uh, available. So please stick up your hands and let's let's hear. Right, yes, and and up there and at the front row. In the front row. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's very very interesting. Um, as I have a very bad memory, I can only only refer, refer to what you've both said very recently. Uh, the 437,000 in the 56 days who reached Auschwitz, as a result of Kastner's inability to keep his drawer open and hand on the report, and you then say that this saved 200,000 Budapestian uh, Hungarians, uh, Jewish people in, in Budapest. I'm curious as to how the, the 200 got separated from the 437 who were, who were shipped. It's, it's a time thing I'm asking about. No, I just, um, shall I answer that straight away? Um, thank you. So um, the 437,000 Jews rounded up then were rounded up in the provinces. Um, the, what, the, 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 that was the process, that very, very deliberately, was to concentrate the Jewish population scattered in the Hungarian provinces, first of all into, you know, you would get from villages clustered into the nearest town, essentially ghettoized, awaiting deportation, partly because I think there was a judgment that it would be, e you'd get away with that more easily than actually turning on the very established Jewish community of the capital city. So you would begin with the more vulnerable communities. And they were more vulnerable, partly because some of those communities had not been in Hungary that long. Um, they, have, they didn't have roots generations deep, some of those provincial Jewish communities. It's a tangent here, which Anthony would know all the details, but the borders had changed. Uh, so some of those people would not be have been considered obviously Hungarian, some might have been considered even Slovak or uh, and so on. And therefore, 
they, they would enjoy perhaps less support from their neighbours than going after the Jews of Budapest. So the idea was to do them in, next, and that's where, when finally Roosevelt and the Pope Act, it really was hours away from putting the Jews of the capital city on trains to the point where, and I think this is hugely important, when Horty gave his order, one train was already on its way to Auschwitz. It stopped and turned back. And that, I think, is so important when people talk about the co co uh, collusion and, or collaboration of regimes around Europe uh, as if they were powerless. There was nothing they could do. I think this is such a revealing example. By then, Hungary is under Nazi occupation, but nevertheless, the sort of supposedly you know, puppet regime or whatever is able to order the, you know, a, a train to reverse and come back, and it does. And I think that's interesting for other countries that didn't do what Horty in the end did. The only thing I would also just push back on slightly is when you said uh, they were deported as a result of Kastner. Look, moral culpability must belong with the Nazis. They were the ones who did the deporting and the killing. We don't know if Kastner's actions, if he had made them uh, the report public, it would have how many it would have saved. Rudy to his death, believed it would have made a huge difference. But I should just be careful to make clear that we remember the people who did the deporting and the killing were the Nazis and uh, the culpability and moral blame lies with them. Well, the Arrow Cross, the fascists of the Arrow Cross in uh, in Hungary um, were actually even killing them and shooting shooting them off the embankment into the into the Danube. That's right. And so, not um, all those two hundred thousand. So, I'm live. afraid not all those two hundred thousand. But I, I mean, I'm not trying to sort of you know. Right. But I, uh, the, the, there was a lot of very nasty killing, and also um, they were forced into a ghetto as the Red Army was approaching. Yeah. Um, and many they say there were massacres going on right up until the end, but. On the play, I mean, in 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 past itself, yeah, and that's partly because Horty was then replaced, in effect, by he was then he was then then uh, put out of, pushed out of the way, or rather, um, so it's quite it's quite true that not all those two hundred thousand who uh, were spared deportation to Auschwitz did then make it to the end of the war. Uh, I think it's probably well, people people debate the exact number, but um, uh, you know whether or not it was one hundred twenty, one hundred thirty thousand who survived, as a, you know both. Haughty and the Arrow Cross to make to survive the war itself, but the point is that two hundred thousand would have been deported on those trains, and that that was halted. Absolutely. And then we got a question at the front. Hi, thank you so much. That was an incredibly gripping talk, um, Jonathan. Me, I'm a huge fan of your podcast. Thank you for talking to us today. Um, my question was, when is this going to come out as a Netflix movie? <laughs> Um, and the reason why I also ask um, is a little bit more profound. Um, I think you've beautifully depicted how important knowledge is as a tool. It's very powerful. Um, I personally believe history has that power, um, where we learn from our past to guide our decisions in the future. Um, and I think especially in current times where there's a lot of misinformation um, and mainstream media not really publishing um, possibly genuine facts, uh, what's your, um, you know, in positions of influence, uh, what are you trying to do? Um, as, as much as I hope that everyone reads The Guardian and your books, how will we get through to maybe a larger public audience? Um, I, I'm so glad you've raised this because this is a huge part of what the book is, is really about. And... Um, we have talked up here, uh, Antonia, about the practical uh, objections that were made to, uh, for example, the proposal to bomb, and also the decision that Kastner made not to pass on a warning, which, uh, which you know, for very specific reasons. But the other problem that the report encountered was not the practical one or it being suppressed, but was incredulity. People just could not believe what was in this report. So even though it was, as it were, hidden away in that desk drawer, one person who worked in that building did see it, which, and was 19 years old himself, and uh, saw that report and realised, we're all going to be sent to our deaths. And he, this young man, Georgi Klein, went to his uncle and said, I've seen this report, we're all going to be put on trains and sent to our deaths. And his otherwise very mild-mannered uncle turns on him and almost is about to hit him. How dare you say such a thing? It's impossible to believe such a terrible thing. And this 
19-year-old man later said that he encountered that response again and again and again, especially from the older generation, people who had dependents, who had lives, who had businesses, who had something to lose, could not bear to hear such a thing. The younger people, people his own age, believed him, and many of them made plans to escape. He himself did that. He ran away, and he then, 40 years later, sought out Rudy to thank him for saving his life. But he tried to reassure Rudy by saying, you know, I'm not sure even if Kastner had distributed your report, I don't know whether it would have made a difference because people find it so hard to believe. And a story I tell in the book relates to uh, somebody who brought out word of the Holocaust before Rudy, not about Auschwitz, because Rudy was the first. Rudy and Fred were the first to give a full account of Auschwitz. But a man you and I again talked about before, Jan Karski, a Pole, non-Jewish Pole, who acted, he wrote a book uh, uh, that called him, or he referred to himself as the messenger or the courier. He came out with evidence of, he'd been inside the Warsaw Ghetto twice. He'd, uh, he was aware that the Nazis were engaged in a program of killing of Jews en masse. He was taken to see Roosevelt in Washington. He saw Anthony Eden in London. And he had a meeting with Felix Frankfurter, a Jewish member of the United States Supreme Court, a judge. And he told this, he gave his evidence, this is in late 42, early 43, to Frankfurter. And Frankfurter says, I do not believe you. And the man who brought Jan Karski, who's there to vouch for him, says, no, no, you must believe him. This man comes with the most uh, perfect credentials. And Frankfurter stops him and says, I did not say he was te uh, not telling the truth. I said I did not believe him. Those are different things. He meant I could not believe it. It was impossible to take in such a terrible thing. And Raymond Aron, the French Jewish philosopher, I quote him saying, I knew, but I did not believe. And because I did not believe, I did not know. And I think that is, for me, a very current concern. You know, when, uh, this is near your area, but um, when I'd finished the book, when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, it's about the time you received a copy of this book, and there were reports in the newspapers, as we know, of Ukrainians phoning relatives in Moscow and saying, we are under bombardment right now, listen, you know, and the Russian, their own relatives saying to them, I do not believe you. We sometimes, and I, you know, I don't even need to tell you about the climate crisis or that movie, Don't Look Up. What Rudy encountered was how hard it is for human beings to believe in their own imminent destruction. It's something we cannot take in. But we also have a very um, clear example that we do not get dictator syndrome. And this is one of the big problems. We have confirmation bias of through democratic eyes. And we've only got to remember that in the 1930s, the British and the French could not imagine that anybody would be stupid enough to want to have a repeat of the First World War. And that's why they totally underestimated Hitler. Uh, we thought in the post-First uh, Cold War uh, era after 1991 that nobody would ever be stupid enough to want to have another land war on Eurasian territory. We got it wrong again. So yes, it, it is this problem of confirmation bias. We, we do not, we cannot put ourselves properly, it's one thing to put yourself in the boots or the shoes or whatever somebody else. You've got to get inside their mind and the trouble is that the mind of the dictator um, is very different, which, which is not often even guided by self-interest. It's often guided by some really distorted uh, other aspects and we just don't get that. Uh, we've got time, I think, for just about one more, or maybe. Lady here. Uh, yes. Oh, lots of questions. Sorry, well, hang on. Wait, wait for a, wait wait, for a wait, microphone. Wait, wait. Um, I, mean, I just want to make a statement, actually, because I think. No, just questions, please. Well, I, I, I want to. Re okay, so how does this relate to what's going on today? So, for example, how much are we believing the people of this country believing what's happening with the sort of people coming here in boats, the kind of hotel stuff going on, the Windrush people who are hundreds of them without, hundreds of them without. Um, so I'm just saying. We're talking about lies and disbelief, and I was not looking at the truth. I just want to say, how is it relevant now? Good. And, okay. I, and it is relevant, yes, yes but... Yep. There we are. And then we'll, then we can take them back. Just keep saying. 
Sorry, I was, I was really just keen to get a, a kind of answer to this. Uh, you, you left it hanging, and maybe this is something you want us to buy the book for, but what happened to Castor? Was there ever a reckoning for what he'd done? I mean, did they ever you know, confront him and ask him how he felt? Was there ever kind of, in a sense, justice done for that awful kind of lack of action? So, it, oh, go on. And I, also, I also just wanted to ask, do you think the people that don't do anything, does that also mean that they are perpetrators as well so does staying silent and not acting does that make you partially guilty which kind of links to things good question yeah. right. <laughs> good for you I like the people getting into it absolutely um, well I'm afraid there are always excuses for inaction um, as we were talking about, you know, the bombing. Yes, they had some justifiable uh, reasons on military grounds, but basically it was, um, it was, I agree, reluctance too. They thought uh, or were convinced that actually, you know, it was better to use their bombers in other ways, uh, which I'm afraid was just the destruction of German cities. So, um, yes, the excuse for inaction, I'm afraid, is um, rather easier uh, to come about. I mean, one can think of more recent examples, whether over Syria or over... Uh, and there have been so many bad examples of intervention in different places um, that actually it's very easy for any leader to say, well, frankly, um, will any make the situation worse if we intervene? Um, the something must be done syndrome of uh, coming from uh, newspapers. I remember in uh, the time of Yugoslavia and all the rest of it, um, there was the whole question of um, the UN um, debating the whole question of armed humanitarianism. I mean, armed humanitarianism is a, is a wonderful phrase with a huge potential paradox lying within it. Um, but, you know, where, where, when you actually go in, you will often find that actually you are making things worse. I, I, I mean, to your point about are they as guilty as the perpetrators? Do they count as the per I, I, Anthony before introduced the concept of evil, and I do believe it's important to distinguish between degrees of evil. And so perpetrators are in their own category. Yes. Uh, and I think we have to hold tight to that. And, but then people who enable it and facilitate it or don't do enough, they, are, they have their own culpability. But I think there are distinctions of degrees. I think your, your question about Kastner is so interesting. It's, it's, you know, I do tell it in the book. He then made his life after the war in Israel. In Israel, he was... Uh, uh, a, a, hung survivor, a Hungarian survivor wrote a pamphlet saying this man is culpable for the death of my 54 relatives because he didn't act. Um, Kastner sued him for libel. The Israeli court found against Kastner and said he made a pact with the devil because the reason, which I haven't got into, is he was having his own talks with Eichmann and the Nazis, which his defenders say were designed to save Jews, and his accusers say was designed to save his own skin. Uh, and the Israeli court found against Kastner and said he had made a pact with the devil. There was then an appeal. The case went to the Supreme Court, and while they were waiting for the appeal, Kastner, who was a newspaper journalist, had finished... At work at one day, he went in his car, he opened up the car door, and two men said, are you Dr. Kastner? He said, yes, and they shot him dead. So he was assassinated. So whether or not that answers your question about justice uh, is an interesting one. Eventually, the Supreme Court then did overturn the earlier verdict. Uh, and so this is an issue that is still massively debated in Israel today and in the Jewish world today, the granddaughter of Kastner is the leader of today's Israeli Labour Party and still defends her grandfather. And the leader of a rival party is the son of a Hungarian Jewish survivor. Oh. So these, these issues, my book is not yet out in Hebrew, but when it comes out in Hebrew, this is... <laughs> This one will be this, this will be these are explosive issues to this day, and right in the middle of them was this man Rudolf Verber, who uh, it was his testimony that met, blew up all these issues. Finally, to your uh, your question right at the end, I think you you asked about uh, you know what about now? I think the the answer for now is. Um, that, that, you know, that, that we learn from someone like Rudy's lesson, uh, Rudy's experience, he understood this profound thing, that the difference between truth and lies can be the difference between life and death. Yes. And he, he, it, that was true in the most extreme way. 
then. To have that in our minds as people are trying to lie to us about situations today is, I think, you know, a useful contribution that history can make. We have to be vigilant about facts and about truth. I don't know if I did answer all your questions, but thank you. Bravo.